spent a number of years in Indiana government before the Supreme Court, serving in, in a couple of different capacities there. He was the Indiana State Budget Director for a number of years. He served as a special assistant to then Governor By for a year, and was then appointed to the Indiana Supreme Court about uh, 19 years ago, a little more than 19 years ago. So, uh, as you see from the, from the uh, brochure that was handed out, while a member of the Indiana Supreme Court, he wrote around 500 majority opinions for, for that court. And, and if you Google that sometime, you'll see that there's an interesting range of opinions that, that he wrote during that, that period of time. Uh, on a more subjective level, uh, having looked through your, your career, it, seemed, it, it struck me, and so I decided to add up the, the years. You've spent about 29 years in public service. And, and you continue in public service at the, at the School of Law. So that's, that's impressive, and I think that's good for our students to hear uh, in a variety of different capacities, not, not all as a, as a justice, but a substantial amount of time in public service. That's that in addition to his work with the state, he also is a member of the um, uh, American Law Institute. He's been active on the Uniform uh, State Laws Commission. And I guess uh, just to wrap that up with respect to this particular law school, he has served on our National Council for a number of years. But the other thing I've been impressed with, uh, Justice Sullivan, in, uh, along those lines is the amount of time he's been willing to, to give not just to this law school, but to other law schools. He's, he's certainly uh, involved in, in the profession, serving as a mentor, and trying to provide assistance to his students. I've heard of many occasions where you've gone out of your way to, to work with our students and spend time with them and so forth. And we, we very much appreciate that. And we appreciate your speaking to us today. Well, you can't do much better than be introduced by Ivan Bogensteiner. Right? <laughs> It's a, it's a great honor to be asked to deliver this lecture, particularly in light of the distinguished individuals who have preceded me in this series. And I'm very honored that all of you have taken your time to be here this afternoon. Uh, my association with this law school began uh, just about 20 years ago. Uh, I've been extended friendship and multiple courtesies from deans and professors and students here. I've been honored to serve on Dean Connison's National Council, as Ivan said, and Jay, as you prepare to leave us for a new venture, we salute you for all you've done for this great school. I've learned a great deal by attending many lectures here, including perhaps the greatest lecture I've ever heard anywhere, Professor Ronald Dworkin's Must Judges Be Philosophers? on November 29th, 1999. Uh, Ed Gaffney and Richard and Rosemary Stiff have provided Cheryl and me with memorable experiences during sessions of the Cambridge Summer Program. Faculty members here critiqued my LLM thesis at a colloquium uh, organized here. The school provided me with two of my law clerks, Susan Oliver Martello and Melina Villalobos, and Joellen Lynn steered me to a third, her wonderful daughter, Erin Shenkow. I've been inspired beyond measure by the brilliance, the courage, the grace, the goodness of Rosalie Levinson. For all of this and much more, my profound thanks I want to acknowledge some special friends of mine in the audience, uh, uh, judges, I see a number of them, with whom I've worked so closely and 
from whom I've learned much. My friend Yi Fang from Beijing via Notre Dame. The aforementioned Aaron Shenkop, uh, uh, who works in Chicago. Uh, she's uh, uh, been a special friend. And I couldn't be more pleased and flattered uh, by the presence of a very special friend of mine from here in Porter County, Patricia Benger, whose late husband, Daniel Benger, was my high school debate coach, uh, English read Shakespeare teacher, wise mentor, and cherished friend. Thanks to each of you for coming. Now, as you've heard, Governor Bai did me the high honor of appointing me to the Indiana Supreme Court, effective November 1, 1993. I had no prior judicial experience. I take from the fact that you've invited me here this afternoon that after 19 years, you are, at last, willing to overlook that deficiency in my qualifications. <laughs> Still, I had no experience with judging when I started on the court, and so it's fair of you to ask today what I've learned about judging. First, I've learned that judging is more than adjudication. It's also administration. For 25 years until his retirement, approximately one year ago, one man stood at the helm of the Indiana judicial system. Chief Justice Randall T. Shepard was a great adjudicator, to be sure. But he had that quality of, it, but he knew that the quality of judicial decision making meant little if justice wasn't actually delivered. He taught us all that the proper and effective administration uh, of the courts goes hand in hand with the fair and partial resolution of individual cases. And in doing so, he initiated and supported countless initiatives in support of a vision in Indiana where the judges are highly qualified and well-trained, come from diverse backgrounds, and enjoy superior reputations for fairness, integrity, and efficiency. Where the courts are properly funded, equipped, secured, and staffed, have relatively balanced workloads, and operate under rules of procedure that reflect best practices. Where courts with specialized jurisdiction, juvenile courts and problem-solving courts, achieve great success in addressing the needs of troubled children and children in trouble, and of individuals dealing with issues such as drug abuse, mental illness, and reentry from incarceration. Where the courts are equipped with 21st century technology that maximizes court efficiency and provides court information to those who need it and where litigants have effective access to courts without regard to financial circumstances. Partners with the Indiana Supreme Court in these endeavors are the hundreds of men and women who serve as judicial officers throughout our state. They recognize the importance of both the adjudicative work and the administrative work of courts, and they are totally committed to seeing a vision similar to the one I have just articulated become a reality. And not just for their courts or for their counties, but for our entire state. They make our system of justice work, and they deserve our admiration and appreciation. Second, I've learned that Judicial selection matters, methods matter. During my time on the Indiana Supreme Court, I saw two candidates for the, you know what's coming next, right? <laughs> Illinois Supreme Court. <laughs> During my time on the Indiana Supreme Court, I saw two candidates for the Illinois Supreme Court spend $9.3 million on a race. Uh, uh, for that office. One 
was strongly supported by plaintiff's personal injury lawyers, the other by the insurance defense bar, all the while the appeal from a multi-million dollar jury verdict against State Farm Insurance was pending before the court. During my time on the court, the New York Times wrote a major story about how candidates for the Ohio Supreme Court had raised more than $21 million over the prior decade seeking to be elected while routinely sitting on cases involving parties or groups filing amicus briefs from which they had received campaign contributions. During my time on the Indiana Supreme Court, contribution-fueled television advertising in a campaign for a seat on the Michigan Supreme Court described one candidate as soft on terrorists and sexual predators and the other as a pawn for big business who literally slept on the job. Unlike our neighbors to the west, east, and north, the justices of the Indiana Supreme Court do not rely on campaign contributions and television advertising to obtain their seats. We have instead a merit selection system in place since 1970 where the governor appoints the members of the court from a list of nominees compiled by a judicial nominating commission consisting of lawyers and non-lawyers alike. Once appointed, justices stand for periodic yes-no retentions uh, uh, votes. This method of selection and accountability helps assure that people of integrity, impartiality, and intelligence are appointed. The involvement of the governor and non-lawyer commission members and the retention vote system helps assure accountability. And the absence of contested elections means that there is no perception that <coughs> justice in Indiana is for sale, no perception that lawsuits are decided in response to party or interest group contributions. We are fortunate to have such a system for the reasons I've indicated, and I hope you will all join with me in committing ourselves to preserving it. Third, I've learned that judging benefits from experience. Many a judge and legal theorist as well as law school orientation and commencement speakers, have appropriated Holmes's aphorism, the life of the law has not been logic, it has been experience. So I feel no compunction in expropriating it myself. Now I said unselfconsciously at the outset of this lecture that I had had no prior judicial experience when I was appointed to the court. But that is not to say that I had no experience with real life issues that were to come before the court. When asked in settings like this for an example of a case uh, for my, where my real life experience informed my judging, I often tell the story of Hook's Super X versus McLaughlin. In 1992, while recovering <coughs> from a serious automobile accident, my doctor wrote me a refillable prescription for Vicodin. When I tried to refill the prescription one night, the pharmacist told me that she could not do so until she contacted my physician, since I had consumed the painkiller at a rate faster than that prescribed. Later, my doctor would tell me that he was furious that the pharmacist had not simply refilled the prescription as his written instructions had directed, that she had no business questioning his written order. In the Hook Super X case, a man named McLaughlin, Whitney, this is the case I was talking about today, right? <laughs> In the Hook Super X case, a man named McLaughlin also consumed pain-killing drugs at a rate much, fa much faster than prescribed. However, McLaughlin's pharmacist followed the physician's written instructions without question. A subsequent lawsuit contended that the pharmacy had breached its legal duty of care by allowing McLaughlin to consume drugs at a rate that posed a threat to his health. Now our court didn't need my auto accident experience to conclude, as it did that pharmacists are professionals 
who have a legal responsibility to exercise judgment in their work, that they are not, as my own doctor seemed to think, robots or automatons whose job it is to follow the orders of MDs without question. But I do think my experience helped us identify some nuances of the physician-pharmacist-patient relationship that made for a better opinion and for better law. No judge, of course, will have relevant experience on every case to come before his or her court. However, as I hope my Hooks Super X example demonstrates, the more real-life experience that can be brought to bear in judging, the better the judging. One way to bring more relevant real-life experience to bear in judging is by enhancing diversity among those involved in the decision-making process. Men and women from different backgrounds and experiences than our own often produce new perspectives on issues and entirely new ways of looking at, examining, and solving problems. This is why diversity among <coughs> judges on multi-member appellate courts is so desirable. Now, hardly anything about the last 19 years of my life approaches the satisfaction of the keen friendship I have developed with the 28 lawyers who served as my law clerks. <coughs> and a major part of the reason I say this is because of how much they taught me. To be sure, some of it merely generational. As each year went by, the clerks were one that much younger than me. But also as women, African Americans, Hispanics, and Asian Americans, they brought background and experience <coughs> to the issues confronting our court that I simply did not have. There's one last point about the relationship of experience to judging that I want to make. Just because a judge on a multi-member court has prior personal experience related to a matter before the court, like my experience with consuming medicine faster than prescribed, <laughs> does not privilege that judge's view on the merits as to the outcome of the case. Chief Justice Shepard had a lot of experience in local government administration, and that experience was helpful to all of us in understanding zoning disputes. But that did not mean we deferred to his view as to the outcome. Now Chief Justice Dixon had worked as an insurance adjuster while in law school, and that experience was helpful to us in understanding insurance disputes but that did not mean we deferred to his view as to the outcome, nor did the background and experience of my clerks dictate how I would vote. But the life of the law has been experience, and the more experience that can be brought to bear on legal questions, the better the answers will be. <coughs> Fourth, judging is often a dance with the legislature. Now, if I channeled Holmes in discussing judging as experience, here I draw from a contemporary jurist in discussing judging as a dance with the legislature, Wisconsin Chief Justice Shirley S. Abrahamson. In 1991, Chief Justice Abrahamson authored an article entitled, Shall We Dance? Steps for Legislators and Judges in statutory interpretation. It described how court decisions can provoke a legislative response followed by additional court decisions, a sort of dance or dialogue. During my tenure on the court, the State House was a veritable discotheque. <laughs> One of the most famous dances, right, Professor Carter, actually started in this building. Right here. In this room. In, in this room. <laughs> uh, in the fall of 2010, the Indiana Supreme Court held oral argument right here, right where I'm standing, right? Uh, in the case of Barnes versus State. A criminal case in which the defendant had been convicted of battery on a police officer. He appealed, contending that his uh, conviction conflicted with his common law right 
forcibly to defend his home against invasion, even from policemen. When our court rejected his defense, the legislature passed a statute expressly authorizing an individual forcibly to resist police officers in an individual's home in specified circumstances. Another example of Chief Justice Abrahamson's bans is the state of Heck versus Stouffer, where the estate of an Allen County Sheriff's deputy who had been killed by a fugitive felon sued the parents of the killer. Now the parents had assisted their son in avoiding arrest by hiding him in their <coughs> lake cottage. The murder weapon was a gun belonging to the parents that the son had taken from the cottage. The estate sought damages from the parents on the theory that they had failed to exercise reasonable and ordinary care in the storage and safekeeping of their firearm. We allowed the estate's claim to proceed, and the legislature thereupon passed a law providing immunity from civil liability for any act or omission related to the use of a firearm by another person if the other person obtained the firearm illegally. Had this law been in effect at the time the deputy was killed, the parents would have been immune from suit because their son had stolen the firearm from the cottage. Those of you who had occasion to watch or read Chief Justice Dixon's excellent State of the <coughs> Judiciary uh, speech last month saw that he spent some time on this very subject or the, dan or the dance or dialogue between the courts and the legislature. Our two branches each respect the other's essential function, he said. You determine public policy and make the laws, and we follow and apply them, whether we agree or not. And if you disagree with the way we interpret a statute, you amend it as you wish. Now, I want to associate myself with Chief Justice Dixon's central point, that it is the legislature, not the courts, that, in his words, determine public policy and make the laws. More to this in a few minutes. But to emphasize my agreement, I need to tell you about two more types of cases. My first example is Stevens versus State, where the defendant had been given a four-year suspended sentence and placed on probation. Got it? When Stevens violated the terms of his probation, the judge ordered him to pr uh, prison for not four, but three years. The prosecution appealed, arguing that the sentencing statute required the judge to order Stevens to serve the entire four years, that the judge did not have discretion to order him to any lesser term. Now, we disagreed with the prosecution's reading of the statute and affirmed the trial court judge. A lot of trial court judges here nodding their heads. The next year, the legislature confirmed the reading of, this, of its intent by amending the statute to provide explicitly that courts could order the execution of less than the entire amount <coughs> of the suspended sentence. Now lastly, let me tell you about Citizens State Bank of Newcastle versus Countrywide Home Loans, Sherilyn, I love this story. where our court catapulted a junior lien into a senior position after foreclosure and transfer of the property. I took the position in dissent that the junior lien was not entitled to the priority the majority gave it. The legislature then passed a law overruling the court's majority opinion, effectively writing my dissent <coughs> into the Indiana Code. So I hope you can see that sometimes the legislature overrules the court's opinions, sometimes it acts in furtherance of the court's opinions, and sometimes it effectively adopts dissenting opinions. It's quite a dance, isn't it? In our constitutional order, the 
legislative branch has the power to make law, the executive branch to administer laws. Their decisions are effectuated through the majoritarian process. Our constitutional order entrusts resolving disputes to the judicial branch and insulates its decisions from the majoritarian process. We call this dimension of the constitutional order right on separation of powers, or in Indiana, separation of functions. One of the most important lessons I've learned about judging is its tenuous place in the separation of powers order. On the one hand, separation of powers gives the lawmaking power to the legislative branch, not the judicial branch. On the other hand, where the law in a case is not clearly established, a judge makes law in the course of exercising the judicial branch power to resolve disputes. I raise here a problem familiar to many of you, the counter-majoritarian difficulty, to use Professor Bickle's apt description, now coined 50 years ago. Doing what separation of powers entrusts the judiciary to do, resolve disputes, inevitably requires judges to exercise powers entrusted to the majoritarian branches. This is why we have the policy of judicial restraint, which, as the Supreme Court has said, is not merely procedural, but rather one of substance. The policy's ultimate foundations are found in the necessity for each branch of government to keep within its power. Well, easier said than done, right? How on earth do judges not act upon their personal political and policy preferences, that's what I've concluded judicial restraint means, when presented with a case where the law is not clear? And not with just with constitutional cases, but with cases like Heck as originally decided, or Barnes or Stevens. Among the ways I have tried to keep my personal and policy preferences from impinging upon my votes on cases before our court was being alert to whether cases were right or whether plaintiffs had standing. Rightness relates to the degree to which the defined issues in a case are based on actual facts rather than on abstract possibilities and are capable of being adjudicated on an adequately developed record. Here's an example. An applicant for a permit to operate a landfill challenged the constitutionality of a statute that required applicants for such permits to disclose their criminal histories. Because the Department of Environmental <coughs> Management had not yet even begun considering the application, we concluded that the case was not ready or right for our review. The standing requirement is grounded in the same philosophy. Courts act in real cases and eschew action when called upon to engage in abstract speculation. We deployed this requirement in the case of, do you remember, Pence versus the state, where future governor Mike Pence, then a private citizen, challenged the constitutionality of a statute increasing legislative pensions on grounds that it violated the Indiana Constitution's requirement that statutes be limited to a single subject matter. We held that Pence did not have standing because for a private individual to invoke the exercise of judicial power, such person must ordinarily show some direct injury has or will be sustained. <clears throat> now it's tempting to think that judges can act on personal preferences in common law cases, contract and property and personal liability claims, where no statute or constitutional principle is at stake. Indeed, common law uh, is sometimes called, what, Valerie? Judge-made law. Judge-made law, right? Very good. But because separation of powers demands judicial restraint, judges cannot decide common law cases based on personal preferences any more than they can in statutory 
or constitutional cases. One way to avoid utilizing personal, pol political, and policy preferences in deciding common law cases is stare decisis, adherence to precedent. Justice Thurgood Marshall makes my point in a 1986 opinion, stare decisis permits society to presume that bedrock principles are founded in the law rather than in the proclivities of individuals and thereby contributes to the integrity of our constitutional system of government, both in appearance and fact. There is particular value to precedent in common law cases and that is that reliance interests are often at stake. Individuals and businesses will have ordered their affairs, like purchasing insurance, based on their understanding of the existing consensus as to legal principles governing contract, property, and personal liability. Considerations in favor of stare decisis are at their acme in cases involving property and contract rights where reliance issues are involved. Chief Justice Rehnquist wrote in 1991. This is also the point of one of Justice Brandeis's most famous aphorisms. Stare decisis is usually wise policy because in most matters, it is more important that the applicable rule of law be settled than it be settled right. <laughs> one of the most dramatic examples of adherence to stare decisis in common law cases during my tenure on the court manifested itself in a decision just a few days before my departure. At issue was the so-called pollution exclusion in the standard business comprehensive liability insurance policy, providing that the policy would not cover an insurance liability for any personal injury or property damage caused by pollutants. Early on in my tenure on the court, a case called American States Insurance versus Kiger had held that the exclusion was just too ambiguous for the insurance companies to be able to enforce. Two days before I left the court, in State Auto Mutual Insurance Company versus Flexstar, Inc., the court once again held the policy exclusion unenforceable. In doing so, Justice Rucker wrote, Indiana decisions have been consistent in recognizing the requirement that the language of a pollution exclusion be explicit. To unsettle the law would show scant respect for the principle of stare decisis. We see no reason to abandon settled precedent. Now precedent will not resolve every dispute. Precedent may be distinguishable. Precedent may be obsolete. Precedent may not exist. A particularly good source for legal principles to apply in such circumstances is the work produced by the American Law Institute, consisting of lawyers, judges, and law professors of distinction, including members of this faculty. The ALI addresses uncertainty in the law by developing restatements of legal subjects for use by courts and lawyers applying existing law. These restatements of the law contain clear formulations of common law meant to reflect the law as it presently stands or might plausibly be stated by a court. I could give you lots of examples of our court turning to restatements to help us decide previously unanswered questions of common law. In fact, I was always willing to consider an argument to overrule <coughs> precedent uh, uh, that was grounded in a restatement. There are, of course, sound reasons to overrule precedent, where a decision was rendered upon then existing conditions, but the conditions may have changed meanwhile, or where the judgment of the court in the earlier decision may have been influenced by prevailing views as to economic or social policy, which has since been abandoned, as from Justice Brandeis, or where precedent is not workable, or antiquated, or not well-reasoned, as from Justice Kennedy. But mindful of our separation of powers constraints, the fact that precedent may be legitimately overruled still does not give a judge license to adopt a personal, political, 
or policy preference instead. This is why restatements are so helpful, presenting to the court a legal rule alternative based on the careful study by lawyers, <coughs> judges, and professors of the law as it currently stands. Here's but one example. Creasy versus Rusk is an opinion of mine in a tort case that I understand is widely taught in law school, including this one. Taught this very day, I understand, in this building. A, news, a, nurse, a nurse sued her patient for injuries she suffered when she was kicked by the patient, a person with Alzheimer's disease, while she was trying to put him to bed in a nursing home. Got the facts. One of the issues in the case was whether the general duty of care imposed upon adults with mental disabilities is the same as for adults without mental disabilities. At the time of the Creasy case, Indiana precedent held that a person's mental capacity was a factor in determining whether a legal duty existed. However, we found contemporary public policy in Indiana as embodied in enactments of our state legislature reflecting policies to deinstitutionalize people with disabilities and in integrate them into a least restrictive environment conflicted with the prior standard. We found instead current Indiana public policy to be more in accord with the rule of restatement second of torts section 283b and adopted it. Mental disability does not excuse a person from liability for conduct which does not conform to the standard of a reasonable person in, under like circumstances. The policy of judicial restraint applies of course with particular force in constitutional cases. For when a court declares a statute unconstitutional, the court is saying this, legislature, notwithstanding your separation of powers authority to make the laws, this law is beyond your power to make. Now some would say that's a good thing. There are lots of laws that Congress and the Indiana General Assembly never should have made, and it's a good thing for a court to tell it that once in a while. <laughs> but apart from the counter-majoritarian difficulty that we've been discussing, declaring a statute unconstitutional oftentimes places highly controversial subject matter <coughs> beyond legislative compromise. When a court declares a statute unconstitutional, it is not just engaged in lawmaking, it is affirmatively restricting the ability of the legislative branch from engaging in its own constitutional function, making law. And when highly controversial subject matter cannot be compromised, dire consequences can flow from the inability of the contending legislative factions to reach compromise. I offer our courts property tax case, State Board of Tax Commissioners versus Town of St. John, as an example. At the time this litigation began, real property in Indiana was assessed based on its true tax value. True tax value was not market value, but rather based on cost schedules that took into account replacement costs physical depreciation and obsolescence, and so vary depending upon whether the property was industrial, commercial, agricultural, or residential. This was alleged to violate a provision of our Indiana Constitution that mandates that the General Assembly provide for a uniform and equal rate of property assessment and taxation. And indeed, the Indiana Supreme Court held that the true tax value system was unconstitutional. To be precise, the court declared unconstitutional as not meeting the requisite uniformity and equality requirements, the cost schedules used to calculate true tax value. Well, as you can see 
our court's decision placed beyond the power of the legislature the ability to compromise the competing interests of industrial and commercial and agricultural and residential taxpayers in the ways that had occurred for many decades. And the consequences were dire, especially for owners of more expensive homes in older urban neighborhoods like Miller and Gary and Twickenham Hills in South Bend and Meridian Kessler in Indianapolis. When I was on the court, my views on the reach of judicial review in constitutional cases comprised the position of only one justice. And you're all very nice to give him an audience this afternoon to present his views. My principal attempts at articulating them came in this town of St. John property tax case just mentioned and another case called City of South Bend versus Kimsey. In both cases, our court declared the challenged enactments to violate the Indiana Constitution. In both cases, I dissented. My objection to the majority's ruling in the property tax case was stated thusly. I can think of no area where we can be more confident of the ability of normal democratic processes working as they should than in taxation. <coughs> Residential, commercial, industrial, and agricultural interests can well pursue and protect their respective interests in state tax policy before the executive and legislative branches without judicial intervention. In Kimsey, the court struck down a statute that restricted the ability of cities in St. Joseph County, and only St. Joseph County, to annex suburban territory because it violated a prohibition on special legislation contained in Article 4 of the Indiana Constitution. My answer was this. The legislation at issue here represents a political struggle between suburban and urban interests. While the geographic focus of this particular law was St. Joseph County, the legislative history shows a hard-fought battle in which the suburban interests narrowly prevail. The court has intervened to turn those who lost a close fight in the legislature into winners. Now, I did not much like assessing property based on true tax value and had advocated a market value system when I was state budget director. I certainly would have voted no on the law at issue in Kimsey had I been a legislator. But I hope you understand the thrust of my dissents. My view in these two <coughs> cases was that separation of powers demanded that the court not intervene to invalidate statutes where it was clear that the majoritarian political process had worked in exactly the way the Constitution intended. Competing interest groups brought their views to the legislature, and the legislature acted on those views, making compromises that it deemed appropriate along the way. Now, what's the counterargument to my position? Professor Levinson is ready to make it. <laughs> and it's pretty straightforward, isn't it? When presented with a constitutional question, courts have a duty to answer it. This point was forcefully made by Justice Bohm, writing for the majority in the Kimsey case. Justice Sullivan, he said, in substance argues for a doctrine of non-justiciability of Article IV issues. But for over 70 years, precedent has uniformly rejected his view. As we held in Dawson versus Shaver in 1822, citing Marbury versus Madison, <laughs> the task is delicate and unpleasant, but the duty of the court is imperative, and its authority is unquestionable to declare any part of a statute null and void that expressly contravenes the provisions of the Constitution to which the legislature itself owes its existence. Justice Bohm is right that I argue for a doctrine of non-justiciability 
when it comes to judicial review of legislative enactments where there is no suggestion that the majoritarian process did not work properly. Now, he maintained that the majoritarian process had not worked properly in Kimsey, and I contended that there was no way that he could reach that conclusion. But all of that is at a level of detail that I can't really get into today. But taking Justice Bohm's point at face value, suppose the majoritarian process has not worked properly in a particular case, would I still treat it as non-justiciable? In arguing against my position, Justice Bohm deploys the reapportionment decisions of the 1960s to attempt to demonstrate the necessity for judicial review of the constitutionality of statutes. What, Sullivan, do you say about this, Justice Bohm's position asked? Shouldn't the court have intervened to rectify malapportionment? And if your answer to that is yes, how do you justify not intervening in the town of St. John or Kimsey cases? I find my answer in Justice Stone's footnote four in his opinion for the United States Supreme Court in United States versus Caroline Products. Caroline Products is an otherwise little known case in which a federal statute blatantly protecting the, meat, uh, the milk industry was challenged on grounds that it violated the Commerce Clause and the Fifth Amendment. The court rather summarily dismissed the constitutional challenges, citing its obligation to presume that Congress had acted rationally. But the court added a footnote, footnote four at this point, saying that scrutiny of a statute for constitutionality may be warranted in one of three circumstances, where the statute appears on its face to conflict with a specific prohibition of the Bill of Rights, where the statute restricts those political processes that can ordinarily be expected to bring about repeal of undesirable legislation, and where the statute reflects prejudice against particular religious, national, racial, or other discrete and insular minorities. Now notice what happens in these three circumstances. In the first, the court is in a position where it really can't avoid ruling on constitutionality. If the legislature takes action that facially violates a constitutional provision, the court can hardly defer to the legislature as the legislature has no authority to make a statute in violation of the plain language of the Constitution. As to the second, separation of powers demands the proper functioning of the majoritarian process, and so it is entirely appropriate for a court to assure that the legislature's exercise of its lawmaking authority does not extend to undermining the legislative, the majoritarian process. As footnote four itself says, the legislature's lawmaking authority does not extend to restricting those political processes that ordinarily can be expected to bring about the repeal of undesirable legislation. The proper functioning of the majoritarian process must not restrict the legislature's ability to pass self-correcting legislation. And note that Justice Bohm's malapportionment example falls snugly into this exception to my rule of non-justiciability. As to the third, legislation prejudicing religious, national, racial, or other discrete and insular minorities, the point is that courts may need to step in to assure that the majoritarian political process respects the constitutional rights of minorities. Why? Simply because their being in a minority may prevent them from having sufficient political influence to protect their rights in the majoritarian process. My position is that in judicial review for constitutionality, separation of powers counsels, if not demands, that it is the legislative branch that has free reign when it comes to political and policy preferences including those regarding taxes and annexation. The court's power of judicial review should be constrained to instances where the legislature has tread upon the very face of the Constitution 
or tread upon the self-correcting features of the majoritarian process, or tread upon the rights of those whom the Constitution, but not the majoritarian process, protect. The last of the lessons I want to share with you today is that I've learned that judging requires collegial collaboration even in dissent. Fortunately, during my years on the court, I had the great good fortune of serving with judges for whom collegiality was a conspicuous character trait. Here's a photograph of everyone I served with, except Justices Richard Gibbon and Mark Massa. From the left are Justice Robert Rucker, a graduate of this law school, former Chief Justice Shepard, who Professor Tillman told you will be honored at this law school later this spring, Justices Ted Bohm and Myra Selby and Roger DeBruyler and Stephen David, and Chief Justice Dixon. Each was the most wonderful of mentors and friends, as were Justices Gibbon and Massey. <coughs> now let me start with the topic of dissent, about which I want to say two things. Earlier, I mentioned an aphorism of Justice Brandeis, that it is more important that the applicable rule of law be settled than it be settled right. By the end of my judicial career, I had come to the conclusion that this was not always the case, but it was sometimes the case. People need to know that the rule, what the rule of law was by which they should organize their affairs. and that what the actual rule is, is not nearly as important as to whether it is clearly established. In such situations, I came to conclude that dissent is of little utility and of some detriment. Once a rule is established and reliance interests set in, the likelihood of abandoning that precedent is slight and the advisability of doing so questionable. What does dissent do in such circumstances except to undermine the clarity of the rule? I decided that in cases where it was more important that the applicable rule of law be settled than be settled right, and where no one else on the court shared my view <coughs> of what was right, to dissent would be little more than showing off, and I would throw my lot in with the majority and make the opinion unanimous. But what about those cases where I concluded that it was more important that the law be so right, or where I had another justice with me? <laughs> In such circumstances, I did dissent. And my muse was former Justice Roger O. DeBruyler. <coughs> justice DeBruyler, as many of you know, was the longest serving justice on our court uh, during the 20th century, and the second longest serving justice ever. He sat on the court during a period of time when he frequently found himself in dissent. In dissent. But his dissents are models of decorum. Others say they respectfully dissent. Justice de Bruyler dissented respectfully. The fact that his dissents were tightly reasoned, not overstated, and were written in a straightforward declarative style, not punctuated with hyperbolic rhetoric, meant that when a new generation of justices joined the court uh, towards the end of his uh, tenure and following it, justices with names like Shepard and Dixon and Sullivan and Bone, the de Bruyler dissents of years gone by became the majority positions of the Indiana Supreme Court. I know I did not achieve the high standard that Roger said, but whenever in dissent, I try to emulate it. Now the last thing I want to say about collegial collaboration, and the last thing I want to say in this lecture, is about our court's record in what I will call Democrat versus Republican cases. To be clear, these are cases where the two political parties are literally on the opposite sides of the V. I spoke at the outset of these remarks 
about the felicitous judicial selection system we have in Indiana for our appellate judiciary. Nevertheless, each of us was appointed by a governor of a particular political party. And up until this point in time, each appointment to the Indiana Supreme Court has been a person of his or her appointing governor's party. Before appointment to the court, as Professor Bowden Steiner told you, I was several times a campaign manager for a Democratic member of Congress. Randall Shepard was, this is hearsay, but I'm pretty sure it's true, <laughs> county Republican vice chairman in Evansville. Separation of powers demands judicial restraint, demands that we not decide cases based on political or party preferences. But given our histories, is that really possible? I think you'll be pleased with the result. For the entire time I was on the Indiana Supreme Court, the political balance was three to two. Three, two in favor of the Democrats from January 1995 to October 2010. Three, two in favor of the Republicans before and after those dates. Yet during that entire 19-year span, there was not one Democrat versus Republicans case decided on a party line vote, not one. These cases, including drawing uh, new city council district boundaries for the city of Indianapolis, determining who won the election for mayor of Terre Haute, contentious issues that some people in this room were involved in, concerning satellite voting sites in Lake County during the 2008 general election, determining who would be the Secretary of State of Indiana when the incumbent had to abdicate as a consequence of a felony conviction. The constitutionality of the voter ID statute. Everyone decided by a bipartisan vote. It does not violate the confidentiality of the conference room to say that these results were not always easy to obtain. Although, as I think about it, they were not as hard to obtain as you might think. Each of us felt a special obligation to try to reach consensus in matters that were critically important for the parties before us, but also critically important for the institutional integrity of our court. We each recognized that our own point of view was not the only point of view, that we could rely on each other's good judgment and goodwill in reaching a solution, and in each circumstance, we were able to do so. I'm very proud to be able to say that, but I hope you will take pride too in the fact that by virtue of our merit selection system, the judgment of a collection of very good governors and Hoosier good fortune, your Indiana Supreme Court has been able to put party preference aside in the acid tests of resolving disputes between the two political parties. And I would go further still and say that our performance in the Democrat versus Republican cases is indicative of the fact that we were able to set aside political and policy preferences in our other cases as well. And of, and of course, that is as it should have been, not just to accord to separation of powers' mandate, but because before us in each such case were individuals and entities who had come to us to vindicate their legal rights and seek protection for their nearest and dearest interests. This has been a long and sprawling talk about some of the lessons I've learned about judging during the wonderful 18 and a half years that I had the honor of serving on the Indiana Supreme Court. The court today is in great hands with five extremely intelligent and hardworking justices presiding over our state's judicial system and giving the full measure of their considerable talents to deciding the cases presented to them. I hope that my remarks today tell you as much about the challenges of their work as my own experiences. And I hope you will give them the same full measure of support and encouragement that you have kindly given me these past two decades. 
Thank you for your kind attention. Well, in any event, 
during the tenure of the record clerk, Shepard hates it when I talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> during the tenure of the record court, then uh, Justice Bowen would speak second and I would speak third, and uh, Justice Dixon, and then Chief Justice Shepard. And we would, there were no time limits, and believe me, it was not limited to just saying I'm taking the case or not taking it. If we decided to take the case, and on an average we would take about two a week, those cases would then be set for oral argument at some point in the future, and immediately following oral, oral argument, we would reconvene and go through the same process again. Uh, but uh, there were no time limits, and it would be very rare that anyone would uh, vote would be just limited to a, 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 a simple deny or grant uh, transfer, or if we had taken the case on the merits, affirm or, or reverse. Um, and I think that uh, I think that was one of the uh, great strengths of our great strengths of our process. Um, I, I, I will indulge. Uh, myself, uh, because Richard's question has taken us into the conference room, to uh, answer uh, the following question, which I will ask myself, <laughs> and that is, what was your greatest single satisfaction about being on the Indiana Supreme Court? And it relates to the conference room. And to the, the following point, see if I can make this, uh, if I can articulate this uh, clearly enough, that none of the five of us was ever expected to bring any particular ideological orientation into the conference room. There was no such thing as being expected to be the pro-defense or the pro-plaintiff, the pro-government or pro-criminal defendant position. Each of the five of us was entirely free to find our own way in every particular case. And we had plenty of three to two decisions over this period of time. But, and I, and I actually I had hoped to do the statistics for this speech and I didn't, I didn't, I just ran out of time. But, but I would <clears throat> predict that you could find no meaningful correlation. Uh, uh, among the justices in who they were allied with in three to two votes. My guess is that I was probably, in, when I was in a three justice majority or in a two justice minority, my partners in the majority coalition or minority coalition were probably randomly distributed among the other four. And this is not the way it is at the United States Supreme Court. So maybe, to come back full circle to, uh, to the answer to your question, Richard, maybe it is those folks have already made their minds up before they go into the conference room, and it doesn't really matter what they have to say about it. But in our conference room, I think the statistics show that it did matter. You didn't know who you were going to end up with in that case. We were each free, as I say, to find our own way, and uh, who we ended up with uh, uh, depended a lot on what we talked about uh, those Thursdays in conference together. Uh, that was a pretty good filibuster, huh? <laughs> uh, I want to, before uh, I call on Professor Carter, I wonder if there are any students have any uh, questions. I wanna, this is a law school. Uh, yes? You seem to really support the idea that the Supreme Court of Indiana is not an elected position. The politics don't really get involved in the selection process. So I'm curious to know, do you also think that that's true in a Citizens United type case where it's influencing the executive branch? Well, um, well I, uh, no, I think, I think, I, 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 really quite to the contrary. I think that, I think that politics is what the executive branch and the legislative branches are all about. And I, I mean, I don't know what I think about Citizens United because, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the issue there, at least as I would articulate it, is do uh, uh, corporations and business entities, and Citizens United applies right down to labor unions as well as it does to corporations, uh, have the same kind of, of, of free speech rights that, uh, that individuals do. And uh, it, it sort of came as me, to me as a surprise to hear they did. But, 
Um, uh, this is not a speech about my First Amendment jurisprudence. The only First Amendment case we had on our big First Amendment case we had on our court over the years, I was in a four to one minority on that too. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, but no, I, I, in fact, I think. Um, I think one of the problems that, um, that, that we have in this country is that people think that they can bring their, that people think they can bring their political and policy disputes to court for solution, and they spend a lot of their time and effort figuring out how to, how to litigate these cases. I, I remember in the, in the uh, I almost put this in my speech, I remember in the property tax case, there was a guy arguing the constitutionality of the Indiana property tax system to us. And I could tell you his name. Um, and he was brilliant. I mean, he knew the ins and outs of true tax value and, and fair market value like nobody I had ever heard during my entire time as budget director. And he's making this argument to a court. And I said, God, I wish you were in the state senate. <laughs> Um, so I know I'm, I'm, I'm all for uh, robust, um, you know, I, am I for corporations and labor unions spending unlimited amounts of money without disclosure as to where it comes from in political campaigns? Probably not. I say this now as a private citizen. Uh, and uh, assuming, you could, assuming you could write a statute consistent with the First Amendment, <coughs> I think we were better off back before Citizens United than we are today. Maybe you can't, uh, maybe you couldn't do that consistent with the First Amendment. The big court, by a five to four majority, says you couldn't. But uh, I, uh, big, I mean, big money is a worry, but uh, politics, the majoritarian process, is, is how the executive and legislative branches were designed to work. And, 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 and as long as they do stuff in a way that doesn't prevent somebody going out who doesn't like what happened and winning the next election and repealing legislation, that's why Bowman's right about malapportionment. You had a system there where if the legislature passed bad laws, things were so, uh, uh, were so structured that they couldn't be repealed. Yeah, the court has to step in there. But um, uh, as long as the majoritarian process can work its will, then, um, then I, I'm all for robust legislative and executive elections. Thanks for your question. So um, I want to take the opportunity to remind our students that Justice Sullivan has been extraordinarily generous with this time. He's going to be available to talk to you in our career center uh, tomorrow morning started at no, starting at 9. Not only will you get the justice, but you may also get some coffee. Um, <laughs> And then, are there anyone else here? Why aren't you writing your brief? No. <laughs> because uh, at 11 o'clock, uh, Justice Shepard will also, I'm uh, oh, sorry, Justice Sullivan will also talk uh, to um, the one L's about uh, appellate uh, brief writing and appellate advocacy. So uh, I just share that with all of you so you know what an extraordinarily uh, generous uh, person he is. Not only has he given us a wonderful lecture, but he's also been available for our students in so many different contexts. So please join me in thanking him and join us for a reception.